Sit back and relax, have some brandy, have a cigarette. You're listening to the fucking power movement. Welcome to the power movement. I'm your host, Mike Powell, and this week marks the 50th day that I've been quarantining. It's starting to get to me a little bit, but I'm hell-bent on not getting this disease. I mean, 50 days ago, I didn't want to get it, but I wasn't that worried. There weren't that many cases in the U.S., and our government assured us that everything was under control. Back then, this thing only killed people that were old or people with pre-existing conditions. Fast forward two months, and the greatest nation in the world looks like a bunch of fucking morons. And like everything else in the world, the successes or failures that we've had with this are all based on what happens at the top of the food chain. Now, this isn't a political podcast, and I don't care what party you support. All I want is to be able to go out and have a beer with my buddies and not have to worry about catching a virus that will eat my lungs or cause a heart attack or a stroke. Actually, what I really want is for my kid to be able to go out and live his life again. It's such a bummer that some of his childhood is being taken away, but we're all living through this. Hopefully, it won't mess up the kids too bad. But now, we're at the point where we're going to see how dumb or how smart we are. States are opening up and people are starting to head out and about. The next month or so should be pretty telling for this virus. Will it explode in the areas where people are free to do as they please or will life go back to normal? Who knows? It's a gamble and the chips in this one are human. The really scary thing is that they're saying that this is the first wave. Like come flu season, coronavirus will be back. And if it does come back, who knows what it's going to do to life as we know it. Does that mean there's no skiing or snowboarding next year? No team sports? No school? No fun? There's so many scenarios that I don't even want to think about. So I just start drinking. And speaking of drinking, I should share something that I've been doing on social media the past few weeks. It's competitive drinking. Before I tell you what that is, I'll start out by saying that I hate Instagram content that is just a live video of someone talking about what they want the world to be. Other shit that gets to me are all the workout videos that I see. The videos that people put up where they haven't succeeded in life yet, but they're trying to tell you how to succeed. And I really dislike all the challenges out there. They are pretty dumb. So I created the best challenge on the internet. Me drinking beer against someone with a prize on the line each time. The way it works is I'm live on Instagram for about two minutes. I talk to my competitor for a minute and then I crush them at slamming a beer. And that's it. It's usually entertaining and I'm purely in it to win shit from people. By the time this goes live, I should be 6-0 when slamming one beer. I did lose to Casual Jesus when slamming two beers, but this is a one-beer challenge. And you can find it on my Instagram every Friday, Saturday, and Sunday night at 5 p.m. PST. One dude that I could easily crush at slamming beer is my guest this week, Josh Dirksen. Josh has been a pro snowboarder for about 25 years. He's medaled at X Games, has had countless video parts, but what Josh will be remembered for is his effortless style and having arguably the best turn ever in snowboarding. Before we get into the podcast, I want to ask you to subscribe to me wherever you listen to me, tell your friends about the show, and follow me on Instagram, at The Powell Movement. Finally, I want you to support my amazing sponsors who make this thing happen. They are Evo, Stanley, 686, and The Ten Barrel Brewery. Now, let's talk to Josh Dirksen. Everybody's going through this. You are a snowboarder who plans on being on snow at this point in the year, and you can't be. What are your days like being quarantined? I definitely feel lucky. I'm in Bend with my family, my wife, my kid, and my kid's six years old. She's in first grade. And so she's at home and doing school every day, and some of it's online video chat with the teachers and the students. And then I'm lucky to have a skate ramp, a little mini ramp on the side of my house. I've been skating that thing for fun and for just physical fitness even. I just kind of head out there and I pump for like half an hour straight, 50 fakey rocks in a row. Click, 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 (laughs) click. And then other than that, I've been trying to keep it chill. I kind of see my job as a pro snowboarder right now to not promote snowboarding, to promote like the benefits of taking it easy and taking the time to let everything fall into place with the virus and see what happens and keep it in control or as in control as it can be. And so I've been trying to really chill and it's odd looking up the mountain. I can see Mount Bachelor from my house and it's odd looking up there 
and seeing it look so perfect. Right. You know, so snow covered, usually I'm either on the hill or I'm looking at the snow getting ready to fall like a brown mountain bachelor or something. And so it's a little odd being up there, but after snowboarding for so many years, the days just kind of roll into another. I don't exactly have seasons, it doesn't seem. It's just kind of the times when I snowboard and times when I don't. And now is ending up being a odd time not to snowboard, but just kind of in general, it's just a time that I'm not snowboarding, which comes up in my life. And there's plenty of other times where I get the opportunity to ride a lot. And so I'm just trying to be patient and be responsible with the situation. And I have a lot of friends in different countries and different states that have it a lot more miserable than myself. And so I feel lucky to be here with a healthy family and a mini ramp in the backyard. Yeah. And you've been in this industry for 25 years. You've been snowboarding longer, but I think like in the industry, industry, 25 years. Yeah. And you've seen a ton of peaks and valleys. In the late 90s, there's a lot of money, then that falls off, and then the financial crisis hits. All different things happen, and this is going to be one of those valleys. It could be one of the worst that we've ever seen in our lifetime. Are you worried about the industry at all? Because, I mean, you hear about the virus, that it might pop up again next fall, and it's got to affect all the resorts, all the retailers, all the brands, all the athletes, all the podcasts, all the everything. And what, what are your fears here? For sure, I worry. And I don't panic, though. I guess I have been through so many ups and downs in snowboarding, and, and I do love the sport and everything it's been through, and it can't always be ups. And so, you know, I don't necessarily worry about that. And I enjoy watching things change, you know, times change. So on one side of things, I don't panic, but I do worry about my friends in the industry. And I guess I worry about everybody in any industry right now. You know, everything's so up in the air on how the dust will settle after this is all over. The reality of it is it's going to take a while to be over. It does look like a pretty harsh one, the financial and all that. And, you know, a lot of my career these days, my job is climate change and kind of keeping an eye on that stuff and being vocal about it. And it's interesting seeing pollution levels drop and, yeah, you know, and just uh, oil prices and, you know, and wondering how this will affect our mentality in the future as a planet, you know, as the world. And so there's ways I can keep myself positive about these changes, but definitely it seems like a harsh one that uh, will cause a lot of problems for a lot of people. Yeah, and I think the harshest it's going to be is going to be here in the United States. But you are not fully American, I don't believe. I think you were born in Canada and lived there a couple years. Totally. I was born in Canada with two American parents, but still Canadian. They claimed me and I got a Canadian passport. And I lived up there two years. My dad was a professional swimmer. Not professional because back in those days, he was going for the Olympics, kind of that kind of style swimming and going fast and all American. And so he went up there to teach swimming and train and stuff. And so while they were up there living for a couple of years, I was born. Me and my sister, she's two years older. She was born in the States. And when I was two years old, a little over, we moved back to Oregon. So I really feel like I'm American. You have dual citizenship though, right? Yeah. And even I actually have uh, three citizenships right now because I married a Swiss lady. I was born in Canada, grew up in Oregon, then married a Swiss girl and I have a Swiss passport now. And we actually spend uh, half our year over in Switzerland. I heard you are a lifeguard in Switzerland. People don't know it, but you were the David Hasselhoff of Lake Zurich. <laughs> uh, no, Lake Zug, to be exact, Z-U-G. But yeah, we totally do look like Baywatch. Like we got red outfits and my boss kind of takes enjoyment in getting cool outfits for us. And one year I traveled back to Switzerland with 25 pairs of red surf trunks in <laughs> Patagonia. <laughs> But it's pretty fun. We definitely looked the part. And it is a job. And it's probably the closest thing to I have to a job right now if you don't count snowboarding as a real job, which it is. But it's definitely an enjoyable one. But I have to go to work at certain times and be there when they need me. And it's just a summertime job and cool people that work there. And I get to eat good food and hang out with cool people. And it's just something to keep me entertained while I'm over in Switzerland. Kind of brings in a lot of like athletic stuff. I can ride my bike to the lake to work. And then when I'm at the lake, I can go swimming and, you know, it kind of keeps me healthy and sane. And it's on a lake. I have a perfect view of the Monk Eiger and Jungfrau, kind of some famous Bernese peaks outside of Bern. And I have a perfect view of that and I get free coffees and it is super awesome. And I've had that job maybe 12 years now, even. 
Wow. And do you swim a lot being that your dad was like on track to go to the Olympics? Were you a swimmer growing up too? Not exactly. I think my parents kind of forced me into every sport except for swimming. But uh, I think my dad found it kind of boring when he was all done with it. You know, he kind of knew how many tiles were on the bottom of the swim pool that he swam at. Oh. And there are tiny little like inch long tiles. Jeez. You know, it is really a sport that needs a lot of dedication. My dad really enjoys the outdoors and camping. And that's what we did a lot when I was growing up is camping. Like every vacation break and weekends, uh, we're off backpacking and in the mountains and stuff. And that's what my dad really enjoyed. And that's what he really brought us along to enjoy that stuff. And so swimming wasn't quite into it or into me doing it. But I grew up with him working at a swim pool. He was kind of ran the pool in Cottage Grove, Oregon. And I worked there for a bunch of years and I hung out with all the swimmers. So I know how to swim and decent. I wouldn't call me a fast swimmer, but I've been around swimming a lot. And that's how it kind of led into the job over in Switzerland as a lifeguard. When I was a kid, I was a lifeguard here in the States. And then it kind of just worked into got it going over there. Cool. And you start skateboarding pretty young, I think, like riding ramps. And I would think it's before the big skate park boom of the Northwest. For sure. Yeah. Is it all like backyard ramps? Yeah, totally. I started skateboarding before I started snowboarding. I started snowboarding in 88 and I probably started skateboarding about 85. Maybe when I was about 10 or 11, my first skateboard was a ninja. Me and my neighbor, Justin Stafford, was kind of the guy. We got into it together. He was my neighbor and always there. And we skated for the next... 10 years straight together until I graduated from high school and took off. But skateboarding has been a huge part of my life. It was the original sport I did standing sideways and the first sport that I was very dedicated to and skateboarded every day. And even as I became a pro snowboarder, I probably skateboarded just as much. Most of my days were filled with one or the other or both. Kind of a lot of things led into that. Like going on snowboard trips, there's always people skateboarding and bringing skateboards. But back to where I grew up in Cresswell, where I started skateboarding, it was a tiny little town. I think there's maybe 1,500 people who lived in the town. And so we kind of sniffed out all the spots that were skatable, and then we built lawn tramps in our front yard. And then the big change was that we built a proper half pipe in my neighbor's yard, Justin's yard. That's when we really got to skate a lot and get better, I guess. But I was into it. Still am. And I'd say even more now, there's a little bit of time last couple of years where I didn't skate much, but I can say that I'm back now. I've been skateboarding every day and my shoes are wearing out and got little ollie holes in them. I'm skating and yeah, it's nice. I enjoy it. And how about winters when you're growing up? Is there any alpine skiing for you or anything like that before you find snowboarding? No alpine, but there is a lot of cross-country skiing. That was kind of my dad's thing. In the summer is hiking and then in the winter is cross-country skiing and winter camping and I always find it amusing how I ended up where I am now, split boarding, and I totally, my job is to go winter camping and take pretty photos with my buddies. That's exactly what my dad dreamed of doing when we were young. He's just like, every moment he had, he wanted to go out there. So I spent many, many years on cross-country skis. And then when I was 13, uh, I discovered snowboarding through my parents going to the hill every weekend to go cross-country skiing, and then I would just run up to the resort while they're up there and definitely it was really helpful having parents that were so enthusiastic to go up into the snow you know once I got into snowboarding it was always trips up to the mountain anytime I wanted but uh alpine skiing no I've like done it a few times over the years but nothing really most people start with alpine skiing then they see snowboarding they're like oh shit that's really cool I want to do that and then they never think about skiing again but you started cross-country skiing which is like a workout of the lungs <laughs> yeah swimming as well I guess in the other season hard work out there and it sounds like that might be what your dad likes to do oh that is for sure what my dad likes to do he's crazy he is a drug addict and his drug is working out okay not like uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger working out like riding his bike fitness yeah and being a swimmer he logged all his miles on his bike too since I think about the time when bike computers came out maybe in the 80s Uh uh-huh Since that time, he's ridden 178,000 miles on his bike, (laughs) his road bike, and he's kept track. (laughs) That's so funny. But it was a challenging childhood, like growing up with him. You know, my wife and kid thinks it's super fun, but that's because he's a 70-year-old grandpa now. But I had him when he was 38 years old and in proper fitness, and we were doing all this stuff. And 
yeah, he was a crazy dad to grow up with, but obviously a good one. It's nice to have a family that enjoys the outdoors and takes all those chances to get up in the mountains. And it definitely shows in my lifestyle these days. Yeah, because you're one of those dudes that will do a multi-sport day of like three different things and it's not a big deal. You'll like snowboard, go skate and surf yeah. all in the same day just because you can. Yeah, and it makes me feel good too, mentally. And, you know, I notice that now when I can't get as much activity in nature with the quarantine going on that for sure my mental state is not as positive, but I'm not super negative. But if I can, I really enjoy being athletic and getting tired and going to bed tired at night. When you say super negative, one thing everyone says about you is you're always smiling, you're always positive, and there's nothing negative about Josh Dirksen. So <laughs> this bringing you down a little bit, I guess it's understandable. Everybody's in the same boat. But yeah. back to snowboarding, I'm sure you get hooked like right away. Your parents take you up as much as you want to go. Are there a lot of snowboarders around at that point, or is it still kind of just a handful? I wouldn't say there's a lot. I kind of got into snowboarding in 1988 when I was 13. Snowboarding started before that, but it was a moment that snowboarding really took off. And so it was kind of me and my friend, friend or two who were the same age, and then all these guys who were awesome ripping snowboarders who were five, ten years older. And so we really had a lot of good riders to look up to. And when I say a lot, my local mountain probably had ten good friends that I rode with. Lamp Pass was in my local mountain. Okay. So there wasn't a lot, but there was enough, and they were all very influential. The most influential was Chad Cooksey. He was kind of the ripper from our home mountain, and he was eight years older than me. So I really had people to look up to, which really pushed me to be a better rider. You know, it wasn't just hanging out with guys like myself who were just learning to snowboard. It's like we had that progression in front of us, and we just followed what those guys were doing. And was it the time where it was all shitty half pipes and gates for snowboarding? Yep, totally. I had a... Didn't ride it much, but I had a race board, asymmetrical with hard boots. My buddies would train gates, and I never quite did. And whenever I'd end up at a race, there's many times I'd ride my hard boots the first run and then decide I'd go faster on my soft boot board. And so not too much of racing, but that was fully part of snowboarding at that time. Racing and then freestyle, half pipe. And there was kind of a little ditch at Willamette Pass that was called the half pipe, and we'd build little highways, little tombstones in it. But there wasn't any parks or anything by any means. That was far before anything was properly built with a machine. You know, everything was either a natural jump or built not even with a shovel, you know, kind of with wet, soggy glove hands. Yep. <laughs> and outside of snowboarding, do you do any other sports or extracurricular activities? Yeah. Well, I skateboard yep. and I surf. Since I was 18, I started surfing. In the Oregon coast, we have really good surf, but it's really cold. And so it was kind of about the time when I could start borrowing people's wetsuits and fit into wetsuits that I started surfing over there. And then through snowboarding and traveling, and there's a lot of good surfing that you end up at. You know, in the wintertime, the waves get better. And so you go on snowboard trips and you can bring a surfboard for Chile, for example. Yep. When you go down to Chile, there's always fun surf. And so over the years, I've definitely surfed a lot. I've taken a bunch of trips to Indonesia and not surprisingly, all my pro snowboard buddies and even snowboard, just good old buddies are all dedicated surfers who travel for good waves. And so I surf a lot. And that's all I did when I was a kid. No team sports? My parents kind of forced me to. I remember I had to go out for cross country running. Oh, well, your dad's like a fitness guy. Yeah. Yeah. My dad told me if I didn't go out that I'd have to come home and do yard work all afternoon. And basketball, I almost went out for. My mom gave me the choice of new skate shoes or new basketball shoes. And I went for skate shoes. And so I didn't do basketball. In, a, in my small little town, there was maybe three skateboarders in the school. Okay. And everybody was team sports. And I was a tiny little kid. I started growing maybe like 16 or 17. So a lot of school life, I was too small for basketball, way too small for football. We we're too small of a school that has soccer. And so I did pole vault. I just kind of did random school sports, but never like passionate about it. Just kind of like, that's what you do when you go to school in Cresswell. And then I found skateboarding, then I found snowboarding. And that's all I did for many years there. And there was a time when my back leg, I'm goofy footed. So my left leg was like three times bigger than my front <laughs> leg, just from leaning back on a centered snowboard all the time. And Got into surfing, and then as I get older, I definitely appreciate 
working out. I enjoy like running and road biking. It's okay with you. You're a professional athlete. You should like those things. Other people I frown on. Yeah, and it's mandatory. I mean, I'm a 43-year-old professional athlete too. And, you know, I do yoga and I feel better when I balance my body out. It can't just be snowboarding. Snowboarding actually doesn't feel like a workout. You know, if I go snowboarding, I'm not really tired at the end of the day. I'm just kind of happy from being snowboarding. But those other sports like cycling and running and stuff that kind of get me stronger so I snowboard better when the time comes. And that's something splitboarding has brought too. That's the perfect combo is I split board and get to the top of the run and I'm all strong and feeling healthy and ready to ride. So splitboarding has definitely extended my career and my physical ability to be a pro shredder. But before even pro shredding comes up, you have high school. And I think there's a whole Eugene crew that you're going over to bend with and riding with. Yeah. At that point, it's what, Jason McAllister, you and a few other dudes? So I was in the tiny little town of Cresswell, and then I went first through 10th grade there. And then when I got my driver's license, I drove 10 miles north to the big school of South Eugene High School. And there I met Jason McAllister. He had moved up from Grass Valley. We became snowboard, skateboard, hanging out buddies. When we graduated two years later in 1994, we both moved over to Bend together and kind of moved over to Bend for Mount Bachelor. It was the big mountain in Oregon and the obvious choice of where to end up. So we moved over here and snowboarded every day and eventually moved in with Marcus Agee. And he's established at that point, right? Yeah, just like a little bit of ahead of us, though. And he was just a really smart guy. He had a really smart dad who's kind of really business side of things. And so Agee, we're all kind of in the same position, Jason, Marcus, and myself. But Agee was always kind of the leader of the group. And especially when it came to contracts and dealing with kind of that stuff, he was the motivator who made it work. So we didn't just sit around being stoked that we're just able to go snowboarding. They kind of helped us turn it into a proper job. You realize it's a business? Yeah, that it it can be a business and that you can make it a lifelong business if you want. And Aggie was really good at that. So we're all on kind of the same level, but he was the smart one of the group, I'd say. Now it is time for me to take my first sponsor break. And my first sponsor is Evo. And while Evo's retail locations are closed for distancing, don't worry. If you haven't been to Evo.com lately, you are missing out on the best deals on the internet. Evo is the first website to focus on the digital space in action sports, and they do it better than anyone else. They have all the brands, all the products, and the resources and customer service to make sure you get what you need. If that's not enough, Evo offers free shipping on orders over $50, a low price guarantee, and a hassle-free return policy. And I have a special deal for you. Shop for any Evo branded product that is as good or better than the big brand stuff, and when you check out, use the code POWELL20 and you will save 20% on your entire order. Evo gives a percentage of sales back to local charities, and right now, that is more important than ever. My next sponsor is 686. They have been the independent outerwear brand in snow since 1992, and they make the best gear on the planet. That's no bullshit. My 686 Glacier Jacket is the best jacket I've ever owned, and it comes with a lifetime guarantee. The whole Glacier series does. And since 686 sent me a pair of everywhere pants, I've lived in them. They are so comfortable. And the latest product they sent me, the all-new Everywhere shirt, is just as comfortable as the Everywhere pant because it uses the same four-way stretch material. And like all 686 products, there's so much attention paid to the pockets, the styling, and the fit. Like the pants, the Everywhere shirt will sell out. So head on over to 686.com and grab yourself one. Those are some of my great sponsors. Now, let's jump back into the podcast. I think you were flowed Grenu and Jaro clothing way back in the day. Sponsor history, I guess it went down. My first sponsor was Jaro. And that was the first one, like, they called me a sponsored writer. And that was when I was, like, 18. And they were my good friends in Eugene that I met when I moved up to school there. And then the first boards, I got a Joyride, one of the first Joyride boards that came out. I wouldn't say I was sponsored by him, but Tom Nordwall, I met him up at a snowboard camp up at Hood when I was young. And he ended up giving me a board. And although I wasn't sponsored, that was a big moment of like, whoa, I can get free snowboards. And that is very cool. Yeah. And so my first free product for snowboarding was probably a uh, Joyride snowboard. 148 had a big cat in the hat on the bottom. 
Then I got a couple Yellow Bus. That was kind of a local company and cool dudes who were kind of part of it. And they're kind of out of Portland. I was never on GNU. I had GNU boards. I had a Dukester. I put in the wrong screws. And so the insert pattern was stripped from the start. <laughs> they had, used to have quarter 20 screws. But that was just a board I bought. I had an Acme, a LibTech Acme too. But kind of my first real sponsor was for sure Moro Snowboards. And that was when I graduated and moved to Bend in 94. And then after that season, I got a job as a pipe digger. McAllister and I did. Digging half pipes up at Mount Hood for High Cascade Snowboard Camp in the summer. Okay. And up there, I met Todd Richards. He was, he's probably still my biggest fan. He's uh, <laughs> such a motivator for me and such a ripping snowboarder and skateboarder. And then to have somebody like that just really believe in your riding and stuff. And he was the one who got me on Moro. And Morrow's an Oregon company at that point. Yep, for sure. They're out of Salem. And Robbie Morrow, who's still a good friend. And Trevor Graves was kind of the marketing department there at Morrow. And him and the marketing department moved on from Morrow and started Nemo up in Portland, which is a hugely influential marketing business up in Portland. Yeah. So it's for sure the right decision for me to make at the time. And at that moment, I had gotten a Burton board, kind of borrowed a Burton board. They didn't give it to me. I had to give it back. But I was kind of riding on some Burton boards and the choice was like, oh, Burton or Moro. And I am always so thankful that I chose Moro. You know, just setting the style and being a local company and just they believed in me so much. Just everybody there and is really personal. And that's where kind of my snowboarding turned into a job, a lifelong job. And it kind of fit really well. Like your style was that skate style that a lot of the Moro dudes had at that point. Yeah. Where Burton was kind of a different trajectory. So. Todd and Trevor were into you just because you're a young dude who has that style that they already like. And they pretty much paved the way for your career in the beginning. Yeah. And at that point, Moro was a huge player. Like, what was the company like back then? In the tiers of who was cool, Moro was right up there, I feel like. Yeah, it was awesome. They're local. And there's a board designer, Sanders and I, and I uh, kind of worked a lot with him and learned a lot more about boards, which has came in handy over the last 20 something years. They're one of the first companies to go public. So there was a little pulse of a lot of money there for a little bit. And it was like fun. We had team photo shoots with masseuses on there <laughs> where every night we had like massages and an incredibly good team. You know, kind of a lot of sponsors when I look back, like Solomon included, like I've always been around really strong teams. And Moro was one of the first, like we had Todd Richards, Billy Anderson, Tara Dakitas was on there. People that I look back and at the time you didn't know how influential they'd be in snowboarding, but at this point it's like, wow, I've hung out with some really talented people and Trevor Graves and, you know, not just snowboarders, but photographers and marketing and people that make snowboarding look awesome. Yeah, the masterminds. Yeah, very, very lucky. And then that was just local and I was local. It felt like family. You know, they were all Oregonians and that's how it goes. And they owned West Beach, too, I think. Yeah. I think Moro bought West Beach. I think kind of the time was went public. And yeah, Andrew Crawford was on there. And we both rode for West Beach. And that was kind of fun. That was a quick little blip in the system. I remember West Beach. I remember more of the West Beach Classic. Those awesome events up in Whistler in the spring. And were you a part of those events? Because you were competing at one point. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I started out doing all the half-pipe contests with Todd Richards. And then it kind of turned into the big air contest. Usually at all the pipe contests, there was a big air event, usually at night. And I kind of started heading in that direction. And this was before slope style contests were anything. And then through like getting into jumping and stuff like that, it kind of evolved into filming. That's where, if I look back at my career, it seems like I was filming for movies. That's where most of my career was made. Yeah, I think by the time you were 20, while you would do some contests here and there, you were always filming for a video part. Yeah. But I think around 19, it wasn't all about contests or video parts for you. You were also getting out in the side country. And I talked to the guy named JMO, who I believe you're tight uh, with or you were tight with. Oh, yeah. Still am. Yeah. Awesome guy. I've had him on the podcast before. And he said that you were with him when he destroyed his femur in the back country. You're like 19 <laughs> years old. You don't have sleds, <laughs> cell phones or anything. What's that whole situation like? I don't think I was actually there. I think McAllister was there and I kind of know all the details from it. 
Like I know it was at Tumalo in his early season. He just kind of dead sailor. What's that called? Where he just kind of fly off the jump with uh, no control and <laughs> he just landed sideways in the snow, which would have been okay, but he landed right on a rock and broke his femur. But I'm pretty sure it wasn't there. You would definitely know. And he oh, was. Oh, maybe I would know, but maybe he would know too. Because I know all the details from it, but I think McAllister was there and he's the one who told me. And I could see JMO thinking that me and McAllister were the same guy at a certain point. There was a time when McAllister and I hung out so much that people thought we were the same person. If we'd answer the phone, they didn't know if it was me or Jason because we just talked identical, used the same words, and rode the same mountains. I'm guessing JMO was in a ton of pain and he either confused you with Jason, like you said, or just thought you were there because he doesn't even remember. Because he, yeah, yeah. he's like, he'll have a lot to say about that one. He was there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I remember bent metal bindings from Mervin. They had a ad campaign going like these bindings will never break. Uh huh. And then after JMO's, they had a shot of JMO just flying through the air sideways, about to ready to break his femur. And then it had a little correction at the bottom. It's like bent metal bindings won't break. And then it's like, oh, actually, they'll break the same time as your femur because his binding broke on that one, too. Oh, <laughs> that was a funny little GNU twist. You know, this is when things are starting to pick up in your career. I think you film with Fall Line at one point. Yeah, totally. I think my first time filming was after the West Beach Classic. I went up there and Artie, I think, was the, the one of the filmers at Fall Line. And he invited me down to Tahoe after the West Beach Classic to come down. And that was my first time filming. And first time being blown away by how good guys were at doing it. I was hanging out with a crew of Finnish guys, and it was Yanni. No, it wasn't Yanni Malmi. Yeah, it was just incredible. I was hanging out with guys who would land every time. You know, and kind of uh, my style of snowboarding before that was a lot of crashing. You know, <laughs> like the landing was totally known that it, that was an important part, but it wasn't until that moment that I saw how much some guys landed and how beneficial it was when you're filming with 16 millimeter cameras you know that you wouldn't see the footage for a while and everything was costing money pretty quickly and that first trip was a moment that i really figured out i needed to start landing more and especially when it came to powder and natural jumps so fall line was the first guys i filmed with and then just because the film community was pretty tight i spent some time with mac dog i think i was in decade mm -hmm. decades ago and now on a snow summit trip and kind of a lot of stuff ended up, I would go to a contest and the Mac dog or fall line filmers would be there and I'd meet them and film a little bit with them. And that would kind of evolve into trips into the backcountry hitting jumps. And so a lot of my career started out on competing and competitions and then would go from that moment off into different places. And when you first start filming, is it intimidating just stepping up to that level pretty young? Because when you go to Mac Dog, that's like the biggest stuff that's out there, it seems yeah. like, at the time. And is that something that you have feel a lot of pressure to produce when you're filming with them? Yeah, for sure. And uh, for sure, I was pretty confident in my riding and having guys like Todd Richards supporting me. You know, I was like, all right, this could work. But just seeing the level of riding when you get into those situations, I was truly hanging out with like the best 1% of the snowboarders on the planet. Yeah. You know, from all different countries where, you know, my world got really big really quick going from Willamette Pass and then Mount Hood was kind of eye opening, but that was summertime. And then getting into proper winter, like that's where you really see who's the best of the bunch. And I wouldn't say I was intimidated, but I was very impressed. And who are the guys that you kind of focus on and like act like a sponge and just take in all their knowledge? Are there any guys in particular that you look to for guidance? Yeah. Like I mentioned, Chad Cooksey was my early years and fully my style of snowboarding and was influenced by him. He was a really smooth rider. Like all his riding was really, maybe lack of a better word, lazy looking, you know, just really like, wow, it doesn't even look like he's trying very hard. And Effortless style. Yeah, and that's fully something that I tried to do snowboarding for my whole life. You know, I thought that was how you made snowboarding look good was making it look simple and easy and smooth. So first off was Chad Cooksey and Alistair Schultz. He was a young rider from Eugene mm -hmm. and he was the same age as me. And he was really influential just being the same age. And he filmed with Mac Dog kind of before me. And one of the first times I filmed with Mac Dog over a road gap up at Timberline, Alistair was there. You know, he's kind of always a peer that was the same age, but just one step ahead. And then Todd Richards was a huge one. And uh, I'll always be incredibly thankful for him. Him and Trevor Graves. He's like your uncle. Yeah, he totally is. Yeah. 
Yeah, and it's always so just humbling how big of a fan he is. Like even now, I'll hear like little tidbits from him. They're like talking about Dirksen. Now he loves Dirksen. It's like oh. But for myself, and especially when I was younger, it's super motivating. So Todd Richards and then Marcus Agee and Jason McAllister, those were huge influences on my career, of course. And then it would just be the guys I hung out with filming, especially the robot food years with UC and Benedict and Travis Parker. And that seems like it was when it was really fun for you, like where. I'm sure Matt yeah. Dog and all those things were fun. I think you filmed with Whitey as well. Yeah. But it's the old school thought process of filming and they've been around and they know they're the heavy hitters, but it seems like everything opens up by the time it like 2003 hits for you. You go to Robot Food and it's like a breath of fresh air in your career. Is that kind of how it felt to you? Kind of. It's really fun filming with all those guys and going to new places and lame. That was the first year I filmed with Robot Food. That was just a year where everything worked out, you know, where everybody knew their job and they did it perfectly. Like all the writers, the filmers, building the jumps, going to the right places at the right time, you know, and just for everybody at the end of the year, we all had enough shots and everybody was stoked. You know, there's nobody bummed because they didn't have enough shots. And so it wasn't really that I wasn't having fun the other years, but that was a really fun year just because things went perfectly. You know, in some years, it just seems like you're heading to all the locations a day late or a day early and leaving at the wrong time that stuff doesn't line up. And that lame year, kind of when I look back on all my video parts, that seems like the best video part I had, the most complete, the most shots, the most variety. And it was thanks to just the system that they had in place. You know, they had already filmed after Bang. And then they're coming into year two with like proper funding from all the sponsors and all the locations were set up. And that was a really fun part looking back at my career too is really fun when i switched film with a new film company and we'd end up going to all new jumps because film companies you kind of get to your routine of where you go and then when you switch you get onto a new just plan of all these awesome new jumps that they've hit once and they know how to build them but it's like new to you and that's really motivating too when just like oh right up here is a perfect jump and you show up there and it's like oh this is awesome and they know how they built it last time they know how to build, build it better this time and so that robot food year was definitely a year when everything lined up. But I can think of years that it lined up Destroyer with Whitey, yep. Kingpin Productions. That was a really fun year. That was kind of the year I really got stoked on filming, you know, and like filming something and seeing the product of it, like in the footage back, like, whoa, this is awesome. And that was a really fun year. And Brainstorm was really cool. And there's some really fun skits that Whitey always did mm -hmm. with Kingpin, Mikey LeBlanc and the cop uniform yep. that was always funny stuff and twos he was always a uh, good at making the skits funny yeah then later i came back to mac dog when brad kramer was making the movies and those were some great years too with the hip jump that kurt heine built the one of june yeah that was definitely a highlight of my career and an awesome day that was a cover of trans world i think yep two covers even had a one foot and a backside air there's kind of a male edition and a on the newsstands edition but such an awesome, awesome day. They built that hip for Vile, so kind of all the pressure was on Vile, Yuli Luma. I was kind of the just guy coming along on it, and I think that was pretty lucky that I didn't feel the pressure, and then just kind of every time I hit it, kept getting better and better and better, and then at the end of the day, it was one of the better days I've ever had snowboarding. Thinking about the pressure, your job is every year to go out and film a video part that people want to see better the next year they want to see bigger they want to see gnarlier like in 2000 you back nine the pyramid gap in 2001 do you feel like you have to one up that like there is progression in snowboarding but maybe i see it more as evolving you know i, I really try hard to do things different like i've hung out with guys that their main focus in snowboarding was progression like jp walker and jeremy jones you know they really took the sport to a new level every year and they're really dedicated to making that happen. Yep. And I guess in my mind, I just wanted to do something different. You know, I wanted to make sure that I wasn't doing the same thing that I did or somebody did last year. And it wasn't always like adding an extra spin onto the trick. It was just trying to take it to a different place or inspire people to look at snowboarding different. And that's where split boarding kind of came into play. It wasn't really progressing the sport, but it was just taking it to new places, doing it a different way. So I guess... Maybe I'm not driven by progression, but just being unique. 
okay. you know, evolving the sport to something that people haven't seen. And as I get older, for sure, like progression isn't like even something for me anymore. You know, it's something I can't keep up with. The kids are ripping so hard that there's no chance that I can keep up with progression, but I can evolve the sport and influence the sport in different ways that I think is really cool. And I hope other people do too. Yeah. I mean, the way that you have built your career, I mean, you did have to progress for a long time, but it's just your turn. It's so perfect. <laughs> it's so pretty. Anybody who sees your turn is like, that is how a snowboarder is supposed to turn a snowboard. And that's more important than almost any trick. Just being able to see that style that you have and the way that you're able to ride, it has paved the way for the past decade of like, you don't have to do crazy stuff. I think you said in lame or after lame that you never want to do a 900 again. And you don't have to yeah. do one at all. <laughs> yeah, that was a quote that I hated for years after that. I'm like, oh, why did I say that? But for sure, I look back on it now and it is true. But also at that moment, you know, I want to surprise people. And if people are like, here's what I want to see next, then that's not too exciting for myself. And at that time, it was just like 900, 900, is there going to be a 1080? And, you know, it just wasn't that exciting. I wanted to surprise people with something they didn't know is coming, not just something that they expect to be the next step in progression. So I guess it, it did prove to be true. And I, I don't think I've done too many 900 since around that time. <laughs> But uh, to set it straight, I do enjoy watching all this progression and some stuff I don't quite understand. You know, when I watch a big air contest now, it's like, whoa, that is too much. Yeah. These days, I guess kind of obviously, I enjoy watching women's big air more. You know, I just relate to it and they just have like such simple style. When I watched the Olympics, the last Olympics, the women impressed me the most and inspired me the most. The men's stuff just gets so complicated. But I am uh, impressed by just how complicated you can make a jump. Stuff I never would have dreamed of back in the day. Now it is time for my final sponsor break, and I'm going to start things off with Stanley, the brand that has been a leader in keeping things hot and cold for over 100 years. They invented the vacuum bottle, and you've seen it so many times in your life. You know, that green bottle that kept your grandpa and your dad's coffee hot all day long? Well, Stanley still makes a bottle like that, and they work better than whatever you're using right now. The reason Stanley is the leader in hot and cold is because their product is better. I mean, they created the category and they keep innovating. But Stanley makes so much more than that iconic bottle. I personally use the water bottles and pint glasses daily, and my drinks stay hotter or colder than yours by at least an hour. You deserve that same quality. Now you can get 30% off all Stanley products by heading to their site, stanley-pmi.com entering the code powell and the number 30 all one word and boom it's that easy my final sponsor is the 10 barrel brewery and they have been brewing beer out of bend oregon since 2006 and since they started brewing beer they are committed to skiing snowboarding biking and drinking beer outside while i see a lot of copycat brands out there lately trying to mimic what 10 barrel is doing in the outdoor space no one puts their money where their mouth is like 10 Barrel. This year, they produced both a ski and a snowboard movie. The ski movie is Watch This featuring Lucas Wax, and then they have Hold My Beer, a snowboard movie featuring Curtis Cizik. They had a whole lot more planned for winter, but with the quarantine, everything has been put on hold event-wise. The good news is that even with all that we're going through, you can still drink beer outside. Next time you're at the store, pick up a six-pack of Profuse Juice a hazy IPA that I'm loving right now, and a beer that gives 1% of sales back to the Surfrider Foundation. Those are my sponsors. Now let's jump back into the podcast. It's easy to forget about your contest because I don't really think of you as a competitor these days. Your first win ever is 99. You win a Vans Triple Crown at Breck. Was that something that you were excited to do was compete? Or was it just something that you felt like you had to do because all your friends were going to this one place to get their runs in and that was part of your job? Well, it was, it was part of the job for sure. Snowboarding wasn't as big of a sport at that time and competing was the proving grounds. And it was where I'd meet up with the filmers and go filming afterwards. You know, it's kind of what everybody did. Like everybody went to Hood in the summer, went to the same contest during the winter and kind of took it from those moments. And so it was just kind of part of snowboarding. And there's times I enjoyed competing and times that I didn't. <laughs> but it's fun when you're winning. Or when you do well and you land your tricks, maybe not exactly winning even, but just when you make a plan and it's a successful plan where you land your trick and it works out. And I like the idea of 
planning for those moments, really focusing on one moment where everything lines up. And Baker is a perfect example of that. You know, I raced Baker for 20 years before I got first place. Yep. You know, and it was, it was kind of frustrating. You were the king of third. No, not even the king of third. That's a, that's a popular thing. But I got second, third, fourth. A lot of people think I'm the king of fourth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Baker, I got second three times, third four times, fourth three times, top 10, fifth to 10th place, maybe uh, five, six more times. Then I finally got first. And it was really fun when I finally got first. A really uh, big relief. You know, when I look back at competing, it's like, oh, it's a lot of frustration. But it's fun not giving up and, you know, keeping at it and trying to work out the details and the glitches and get into that moment where it all lines up at the right time. So in the end, it was fun. And I definitely like making a good story. You know, and I kind of think about after I won Baker, I went back and looked at all my results, kind of like Googled stuff. And it was kind of hard to find all the old stuff. But I found the second year, I think it was, I went to Baker. I got third place and I missed first place by 0.03. <laughs> <laughs> but I think to like how much of a different situation that would have been if I would have won that year. And I'm like, oh yeah, Baker's easy. Yeah. <laughs> and just how it would have changed my career too. You know, Baker was always such a motivating race for me just to be a good, solid rider. Before the race, I would try to ride as many days as I could and get as strong as I could. And, you know, I'm kind of thankful that I had motivation like that through my career. Looking back on it now, I'm kind of glad that it happened like it did. But going through it, I probably would have chose winning at the second year and calling it good. Yeah, that's one type of contest. The bank slalom's legendary within snowboarding, and it's the heartbeat of the sport almost. Yeah. But you're also in the most mainstream part of the sport as well, because you have an X Games medal. Yeah. And you get third at the X Games. And what's the difference between standing in the start gate at Baker and being at the top of the jump at the X Games and they're dropping you in? I mean, is it a different kind of nerves? Yeah, I guess when I was young, I wasn't too worried about crashing. I mean, I did it all the time. But standing at the top of like a big icy kicker, you know, you got the injury stuff in your mind. And staying at the top of Baker, I don't really get worried to ride down. I know I might blow out of the course or something, but I don't think really anything is going to be painful. And so that's a different part. It's more pride. Yeah, for sure. It's a little different mindset. And there's not as many eyes on you as like the X Games. A lot of people are watching and paying attention. And at that time, that was before the Olympics. And that was kind of the pinnacle of the sport. That and the U.S. Open, I guess, were the two big events of the year. Then when it worked out, you're like, yeah. But uh, it sure was heartbreaking when it didn't work out. In the last contest I'm going to bring up, there was a big one in Chicago in like 2004. I think there was like 50 pro snowboarders there. Yeah. Kanye and Ludacris performed there. To a pretty down-to-earth, chill snowboarder like yourself, what's an event like that all about? Well, that one was kind of funny. We got there and it was in the stadium, just right in the middle of the city. It was kind of a blur. We were in an awesome hotel and everybody's there. And then we got to the jump and there wasn't quite enough speed. And so they built this little tower on top of the tower. And all of a sudden you're kind of standing on top of the Windy City, I think it's referred to as, but on this tower and just barely getting speed to get across this kind of chunky jump. And I don't remember it being much of a contest. I think people decided that it was too sketchy. Everybody except for Travis Rice. I think Travis Rice ended up saving the contest for the organizers because he didn't mind it and went for it. Back at those times, there were some moody snowboarders, myself included, but also some poorly planned contests. You know, And so if you wanted to survive in pro snowboarding, you had to show up and make decisions whether you thought the jump was safe or not. I'm pretty sure, looking back on that Chicago jump, people weren't feeling it. Like, it wasn't a big progression for snowboarding, but it did happen. It looked like an all-time list of riders. I mean, there was like 60 dudes invited. They put a lot of money into the talent. It's a shame that they screwed up the jump. Yeah, not enough speed. But also that snow quality on the jumps, it was just so chunky. Back in those days, it was almost like a shaved ice. You yep. know, just a snow cone machine shooting them on there. and. Yeah, I remember that contest, but not for the snowboarding part of it. Just the spectacular and big names and going to Chicago. Andrew Crawford was there with me. Yeah, the contests I look back, though, and think were the best ones were like West Beach Classic, X Games. Those were always super fun. That was super fun getting a medal 
at that third place. That was a one footed backflip year. Yeah. And kind of surprisingly, the one footed backflip got me like seventh place. And then I went and did a backside nine, and that's what got me third. That's crazy. And I think when everybody remembers that contest, I think it was the backflip. But I kind of learned that trick, that trick to choose one trick from Kevin Jones, who ended up being a good friend over the years. And there's kind of a time in snowboarding when you just dial in one trick so you could show up to any jump whether it be the worst jump you've ever hit and you can still do that one good trick backside nine was the one that i kind of dialed in like i could throw out off a 10 foot jump a 120 foot jump it was kind of like the guaranteed go-to trick go to chad's gap yep chad's gap felt the same as like any other jump with that trick and jones like he ended up making tons of money for the front side nine front side jones we called it but at that time The jumps were just, you never knew what you were going to get, the snow quality, the jump size, the jump speed. And so you just kind of had to get a small handful of tricks that you could just do at any time to be successful in those events. Yeah. Well, we'll get back to your career, the sponsorship side, because Moro was killing it and they went public. And it sounds like things are not going well behind the scenes at Moro and everything's about to fall apart. Do you have any idea that things are, are not going well at your sponsor? Uh, yeah, Yeah. I knew what was going on for sure. And I think a lot of people would look back and blame it on the step-in. That was the heyday for step-ins. The clicker was famous and everybody was coming out with a step-in and Moro designed a step-in and rumor has it, Burton had a patent on every aspect of the Moro step-in. And so they invested all this money into it and then it ended up being kind of a flop. They could sell, but they had to give part of the money. And maybe this is just what I heard. I'm not sure exactly the truth. But I think that was kind of a turning point. But also kind of turning point in snowboarding where there was tons of money and then kind of things started falling through, like companies going public and then not quite being worth what they initially were forecasted for. We kind of saw it coming a little bit. Yeah, just times changing in snowboarding. And then Moro got bought by K2, which for me wasn't horrible. It was just kind of a change you know it's kind of fun meet new people travel in new places and so they kind of moved to k2 and the moral boards were made there and they made some couple good boards for a year or two there and they got a good team going and it was sad to see moro move out of salem and that era was gone but at least that era was there and then i was able to be part of it but uh it was just kind of a change like there's been many changes for me with sponsors Maybe not as much over the last 10, 15 years, but in the beginning, stuff was always changing. You know, companies were buying other companies and companies were going under and companies were becoming famous. So yeah, it was just kind of another change. And all the teams or no, not all the team. Todd Richards went up to K2 Morrow, Andrew Crawford. That was kind of a bummer. He went to ride for Rozzy. But for me, it wasn't too harsh. It was just kind of another change in a quickly changing industry. When the run ends at Moro, it becomes a time where people have to start looking for brands. Does someone go out and pitch you to Solomon or do you actually go out and try to get sponsors yourself? No, I didn't go out and get sponsors myself so much. Chris Owen was the team manager at Mervin at that time. And I almost signed with Mervin, kind of like hours away from signing with Mervin. Then my other buddy, Kale Gray, was a team manager for Solomon, and he was good buddies with Owen, too. And he called me up on Chris Owen's phone. He's like, hey, can I talk to Dirksen? As we were driving up, kind of to sign a contract with Mervyn. (laughs) And then they threw that out there. And I think Solomon became interested after they saw the backside nine on Pyramid Gap. That's kind of what caught their attention. And so I had a choice to make whether to ride for Mervyn or ride for Solomon. Looking back, I was like, oh, that was a decision that I made in life. But I'm always thankful of riding for Solomon for two reasons. I met my wife, who we've been married forever now. And I met her because she rode for Solomon too. So I chose to ride for Solomon. And then the first team trip I went on, I met my wife and then we got married and lived happily ever after. And you know, so that was a moment that was like, oh, I'm glad I rode for Solomon. And then also at that time, I really loved traveling and adventure and you know, I'd been riding for Moro out of Salem, you know, which was really cool and really family. But uh, kind of at that moment, I'm like, I want to go places, you know, I want to travel to Europe. So I saw Solomon as exciting, something that would get me on trips over to Europe and dealing with different cultures and people. And so I chose to ride for Solomon. 
and uh, I've been with them since then. You built a ton of street cred with Moro in your time there. Solomon, you know, to pick you up, it sounds like the perfect fit from their standpoint, because at that point, they're making blades, skis, ski boards, and bringing you on helps legitimize, I would think, the whole program. Was there any reservations on your end going to a big brand like Solomon? No, not even. I've kind of grown to love them. Grown to love like how they do things, their quirky little stuff. But for sure not the skiing thing. Like my best friend in life, my best man at my wedding, Schroeder Baker, he's a pro skier. Yeah. And so kind of from the start, from when I was about 18, when I met Schroeder, skiing was accepted. I cannot talk shit about skiing because, you know, it's a legit sport and an awesome sport. And, you know, I never had kind of the hatred towards skiers. Like my friends were skiers and that wasn't anything. You know, I kind of grew up cross-country skiing. That's not exactly something. But yeah, that wasn't really on my mind at all. And then I, through Moro, I kind of got into designing boards and knowing about board design and what works and what doesn't. And for me, looking at Solomon, they're really technical. My buddy Jason McAllister was always riding for him. And so I had seen all his boards and I'm like, man, those boards look awesome. And I was really impressed by just kind of their design and the boards that they had. And so when I got on there, they had snow skates too. Those were kind of fun little time when they started making those skate decks with snowler blades on the bottom. And so, yeah, I think it was a good fit for Solomon. Like I liked all the qualities that they did really well. They're genuine. And even now, like they tell me ideas and I'm like, that is nuts. But there's been plenty of ideas over the years that have turned out to be nuts. But uh, other ones are like turned out to be a really good influential idea. It's like, oh, you know, it's cool working with people who are creative in their own way and not just thinking like me and they fit my style of riding and the boards that I want. You know, that's a huge thing in snowboarding is having the right board. Yeah. Without that, you're at a huge disadvantage. And so they've always given me the right boards and they're cool people. And kind of a French mentality is uh, people don't get fired. It's kind of like your their family at Solomon. The same guys have been there since I got on Solomon. That's pretty cool. Yeah, totally cool. I mean, you don't have that at any other brand that I hear of. I mean, I spent 16 yeah. years ago, and I will tell you that the second they realize they need to cut a budget, they don't care if you're family at all, you're gone. Yeah, and I don't think Solomon would do that. You know, I think it goes both ways, too. Like, I don't think I could ever leave them. But if I'm still snowboarding, I don't think they'll ever fire me. Like, if I'm genuinely, like, loving snowboarding and wanting to ride their boards, I have no fear that they keep me on forever. But I think the same goes for my side of things. Like, as long as they're enjoying making the boards on their side of things, I'm going to ride for them forever. They're all good friends, and I love catching up with them when I do see them. And they've been a super awesome sponsor. And then after marrying a Swiss girl, too, they're four hours from my house in Switzerland. So I kind of have a really good relationship in the summer as I go down there and look at all the new products they're designing. And you know, I kind of have a really hands-on deal with them where I can really be part of the products at a time when they're all getting dialed in for the next winter. Yeah, and, and speaking of their products, they have the Derby board. What other products have you been really involved in making where when it comes out, you're like, my fingerprint is all over this thing? Split boards. I mean, that's an obvious one. Yeah. I forced them to do that. You know, I, I told them that I need a split board. I started filming with Jeremy Jones for the deeper, further, and higher. That was the moment Jeremy came out with Jones snowboards and the first proper well-designed split boards and i totally came to solomon and told him that they had to start making me a split board i think i told him or i was gonna die <laughs> you know that i was gonna not be able to make it down alive so they started making split boards and they'll make me any split board that i want like kind of how they design the board any board in the line can be turned into a split board and so just every summer i figure out which board i want to ride the next winter and they make me a split board version of it and those boards end up coming out in the next year's lines. And so from the split board side of things, a really big part. But that's a small part of Solomon. You know, a small part of any company is split boards. When you think about how many 153 park boards they sell compared to 160 split boards, it's like a huge difference. We'll see when the parks open back up. <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah, maybe split boards are a big one now. <laughs> and then early on, I had a huge influence, but... Luckily, I'm not the only influence on Solomon. You know, I've kind of learned over the years that the boards that I love aren't necessarily the boards that are made for the general public. For sure. Like all my boards are incredibly stiff. 
So a lot of influence I've had on Solomon were, were maybe like the shape of a side cut, but not the stiff flex pattern of the board. You know, I'll have parts of the board that are influenced by me and they fully look at my riding style and what I'm doing and they design boards that they're excited to show me like, here's the board that we know you're going to love. Nice. Yeah. And after so many years, it really does work. They get me the boards that have a clean side cut. That's something that always comes up. There's a lot of magnet traction kind of stuff in every board company's boards. That kind of like a board that just has a round side cut, pretty much a really smooth side cut. So they're always the boards that they design, like the Super 8. That was a board that I worked together with them that's really related to my riding. All those boards definitely have stuff that is my influence. Okay. You brought up Jeremy Jones. I guess this will be the final project I really talk about, but you went further, deeper, longer, faster, and harder with Jeremy Jones. That dude's a leathery mountain badass that I would <laughs> expect to camp in the snow for months at a time. And you had already done human-powered stuff when you went out with Jeremy on my own two feet project. Yeah. But are Jeremy's projects a whole nother level where you have to totally prepare to go out with him? Yeah, they are for sure a whole nother level. They're very intense. Like after you get done with the Jeremy Jones trip, you need some downtime to kind of get your head back. And every day is intense. And uh, he is a machine in the mountains. So motivated to just make it happen, not irresponsibly, but just to chip away at it so that it is possible. Just going a little bit in the mountains and the next day going a little bit farther and just pushing as much as he possibly can safely. It is amazing memories, but super intense. At the top of many of the runs I took with Jones, I accepted that I might die. <laughs> you know, <laughs> drop it in. It's like, it might, but we made it this far. And like, with such a solid crew, it was really comforting. You know, the guys that we hung out with, many of whom were skiers too, which is another reason not to be down on skiers. It's like, we hung out with such talented riders, skiers, filmers, guides. When those moments came up, they like realistically looking at them, they seemed like such sketchy positions to be in. But then when you look at the whole picture, it's like, I think this is reasonable. We can't take this run and chances are nothing bad's going to happen. And if we do get to take this run, it's going to be the best run of my life, which for sure the best runs of my life, specifically one corrugated in Alaska was with Jones on one of those trips. But they are 100% intense. Does he push you to do shit that you would never even consider, but you do it because you're with Jeremy Jones and Jeremy's going to do it? Uh, yeah. I kind of always saw myself on those trips, maybe three or four riders, Jones, Rylan Bell, myself, Lucas Dabari. We'd show up at the bottom of the face and look up at it, and I would see one run or one line that I would do. I'm like, oh, geez. I, hopefully no one else wants to do this <laughs> one line. And then I'd look over at them, and they all had their eyes on different stuff. You know, in the whole Jones formula, like I kind of had a spot in the system where I was picking the lines that were a little simpler, you know, a little more fun loving for the average person. And I definitely had my spot in there and I wasn't like standing right beside Jones the whole time, dropping in right behind them or sure. anything. You know, we we're kind of a team and we we're trying to get all the good lines ridden in the mountains where we we're at. And I had my eye on different lines. I think coming from Mount Bachelor, I really liked kind of dropping in and not worrying, not thinking too much. Lines that just kind of flow together and you can kind of space out. And whereas Jones is the lines he does, it's you have to take a left or a right at certain times. You know, there's things you have to do or things can go really wrong. So we're all looking for different lines on those trips. And I think I fit in well. For sure. Everything that you were doing with your style of riding at that point lined up with everything that he was doing. So yeah, it really worked out perfect. Yeah. We've been going yeah. for a while, and I said that was going to be the last topic, but I didn't even bring up the Derby yet, and I need to bring it up a little bit because you have a signature event, and I feel like everybody has a signature event these days, but yours was one of yeah. the first signature events, and we talked about Baker, and Baker is like a, I would say heavy, but it's like a heavier event than your event at the end of the season that kind of is the official end of snowboard season almost, maybe not the official end. The highlight, for sure. And your event is the kickoff of the season, so... You have the Dirksen Derby that you created for a dude that broke his neck. He was an eighth grader, Tyler Eklund. And did you know him before you created an event for him? No, not so much. Like I knew of him, like the Bend snowboard community is pretty tight, you know, and he was part of the local snowboard group competition of the young kids, all the rippers. And so he was a up and coming snowboarder and he went down to nationals and just kind of had a freak crash that just hit wrong and he broke his neck and it was really no health insurance at that time and 
really challenging for everybody who knew him and his family and a lot of bills and a lot of time in the hospital. And so that next year, kind of in my head, I was inspired by Mount Baker Bank Slalom. I was like, oh, I want to do a bank slalom down in Bend. And Bend, Mount Bachelor, is kind of known for early season. Like we can get maybe 20 inches of snow and it's all of a sudden really good. Yeah. Good snowboarding. And so kind of early season came up. And then the situation with Tyler seemed like a perfect opportunity to get the community together to raise money for his bills and just to help him get to a spot where he's stable. And so it just kind of all came together. And there was another family in town who started a uh, party for him. And eventually the derby turned into the snowboard race and the kickoff party, which was started by the Baloo family to raise money. And then we all just kind of combined forces. And it's kind of evolved into a lot of different things now. And for Tyler specifically, like now we raise money for a lot of things. We raise money for the adaptive sports program, Oregon Adaptive Sports in town. And they're the people that get Tyler up on the hill. We have a sit ski that a guy drives and Tyler gets in the sit ski, we lock him in. And he, most years he gets a run down the course. So awesome. Yeah. So awesome. And when I look at the Derby and how it benefits Tyler, like the money is just kind of stuff that comes and goes, but him being a part of this community still and the kickoff party is a big one too. He gets to go hang out with all his friends and see him on Hill and just kind of that whole weekend's like a really social time for everyone, but uh, especially Tyler. And so money's still kind of part of it, but um, just kind of making memories for a lot of people, especially Tyler Eklund is something that we really focus on. And it brings people in from all over the place. And it's one of those events like Baker, like we said, but it's the first event and it's more think about the race when you're on course and that's about it i feel like for your event yeah and it's gonna have your name living forever yeah yeah for sure yeah it's fun my skier buddy schroeder baker came up with a name too to give him credit for that the dirks and derby it's a good one yeah it has a little nice little ring to it but uh yeah it's become really cool i definitely try to make it for everyone you know every year i build the course with plans to get this year we had travis rice and Tyler Eklund. And I build the course to get both of those guys down the course safely. And so I try to make it for a wide variety of skill levels and abilities. So a lot of people, the bitchier of the bunch, complain that it's too easy, too short. It's only 30 seconds. There's two courses for a combined time, and both courses are 11 gates, 30 seconds long, and kind of generally running speed. You know, you're not moving very fast. But what I really enjoy is in the end of it all, the best snowboarders end up going the fastest. It's not just a random draw. The best riders do the best. And I really enjoy that, getting all those talented top riders out here and then seeing them ride a really simple, fun course and getting ripping times down it. You know, it's a really cool part. It's a pretty awesome thing you do, and it's cool that you do it for a kid that you didn't even really know, although I'm sure you know him very well now. Yeah, really well now. At this point in the show, I have something that I call inappropriate questions. And usually I reach out to a person that you know, I have them ask you three inappropriate questions, they put you on the spot, and it's usually pretty funny. But I reached out to a lot of people for you, and everyone came back saying that Josh doesn't do anything inappropriate. (laughs) I was told that if I want a story of Dirksen wrecking a car, I'm not going to get that. He doesn't do that (laughs) stuff. If I want to hear a crazy story at the bar, those don't exist either. So I'm going to ask you three inappropriate questions, I'll take that up on my own, and While I hear that you might not have stories of crazy nights at the bar or anything like that, have you had that one night in Bend that you're kind of embarrassed about that you went just too big? Inappropriate nights in Bend? Yeah, or just inappropriate nights in your travels as a snowboarder. Yeah, I mean, I lived through the the glory days of snowboarding where we went on like shop tours and there was tons of money and flying around and like I was around stuff. You know, I was around like Billy Anderson when he got arrested in Japan and stuff like that. I wasn't the most irresponsible. I'm pretty cautious, I guess. I tried to be a good drinker, but I never was quite. I was uh, more of a puker than a good drinker. Where's the strangest place you've puked? Maybe Germany during Oktoberfest. Yep, big oversized beers with Giggy Ruff and Brad Kramer and McAllister. Not a very exciting answer. Maybe I just don't remember them, too. Based on all the things I've heard about you, that's kind of par for the course. There shouldn't be a crazy answer there. With question number two, do you look at yourself as a role model? Uh, Yeah, for sure. 
And is that why you wear a helmet these days? Yeah. You know, I guess I wear a helmet because why not? My job as a pro snowboarder is to influence product. You know, and if I don't like a product, then I should, you know, influence to make it better. And so I kind of committed to like, I'm going to wear a helmet and I'm going to work with Smith to make better helmets that fit better and more comfortable and more usable for all my friends. And I kind of like it. It took me about a year and a half to get used to a helmet. You know, it took a while to kind of get my kit dialed and stuff. First off, I started wearing it because my kid, you know, I have a six-year-old kid and my wife. It's like, I want my wife to wear a helmet too. And then it was kind of just out of spite, like, why don't I wear a helmet? You know, like, I don't have a reason and you kind of get sick of people going, why don't you wear a helmet? You know, I think my generation grew up setting our abilities to the level that you don't need a helmet. You know, it's like, well, if you hit a tree and it's like, well, I'm not going to hit a tree. Yeah. You know, I'm accept that if I hit a tree, that that's going to be really bad no matter how I do it. And just kind of a few things. I'd say my, my kid, my family were first and my job is to influence and develop product. And if I didn't like helmets, that I should work to develop one that I do like. And then riding around the mountain, I kind of accepted that it's not just my choices that I'm making. Like, don't hit a tree. Okay, I won't hit a tree. When you ride around the mountain, a bachelor, there's fully other people riding around that totally come close to you and can hit you. And, you know, it's not always the decisions that you make. And it's like, all right, that's a good time to have a helmet on. And I I do have a side of things with helmets that like I see kids in the park bouncing their head off the ground 20 times a day with a helmet on. That's not good either. You know, it's the whole NFL thing, the football, you're supposed to not hit your head. Like even if you have a helmet on, you shouldn't be hitting your head too. It's a little battle in my head whether a helmet's good because in my life, I've never hit my head. Skateboarding or snowboarding, the only time my head touches the ground is when it has a helmet on. You know, I think I just kind of misjudged the weight of my head. And actually, that's not 100% true. One time I bonked my head skateboarding. Well, I got a big on my forehead, a little golf ball or a big golf ball thing from bonking it. You're talking one time in 30 years. Yeah, totally. So it (laughs) isn't zero. But it's like I am confident with that. But then, you know, I don't care. I'll wear a helmet. I kind of enjoy it now. And I wear it all the time. When I go split boarding, it's always on my head. I kind of made a commitment not to put it in my backpack, too. So it took quite a long time to figure out a helmet that could stay on my head for a whole camping trip. You know, they just always have it on. And kind of a lot of dangers that come up while I'm split boarding or not necessarily while I'm riding downhill. It's kind of right when I get up to the top of lines or when I'm going through the woods and snow's falling off the trees and ice. So I wanted to come up with a helmet that's just on my head and cozy full time. So it hasn't been easy, but it's kind of a fun project that I committed myself to finding a good fitting helmet that I can wear all the time. And wearing a helmet's not that bad. Like at this point, after a year and a half of forcing myself to like, I kind of find a helmet comfortable, you know, against the weather and the elements. And I have a system with my hood, like I don't have ear flaps and I kind of use my hood on my jacket a lot riding. And it's kind of like cozy. I do enjoy it on a stormy day. And I like how a helmet feels now, but it took a while. I stood in front of a mirror analyzing my clothing layering system and stuff for hours and hours and hours. (laughs) But I like the point that I've been and I like that I ride for Smith and they have a strong helmet program. So I'm happy where I am now, but it wasn't easy. I think it's not easy for a lot of top pros who have lived life without it. I will jump into my final inappropriate question. And... It sounds like you're one of those dudes that's good at everything that he does. Like anything you try, you're good at. What are the things that you suck at? I can't throw a ball. Like if you throw a football, it would look funny? Yeah, and it does look (laughs) funny. Like guaranteed, it'll get pointed out first time I try to throw something. Like I don't think my dad can throw a ball either. I'm guessing he can't. But any sport that involves throwing a ball, I'm pathetic. All right. Worse than bad. Like it's like, oh my, ooh, that's uncomfortable to watch. (laughs) Laughable. Yeah. All right. Well, looking at your career, while you can't throw a ball, you have done it all. Contests, video parts, marrying gold medalists. But what you're going to be remembered for is your turn. And it's puts you on a level with dudes like Terjay and Jamie Lynn. I mean, there's not too many snowboarders I can think of that are still relevant that don't have to trick anything at all anymore. And you haven't had to do that, it feels like, since the robot food days, which is pretty amazing. And I want to thank you for your time, and I'll look forward to what you put together moving forward if we ever get out of the house. Thanks. Yeah, I appreciate it. This is my first podcast, and it was a lot of fun. 
thanks for all the nice compliments and the research that you did. It's fun looking back on my snowboard career, remembering all those good times. Sorry, I didn't have more uncomfortable moments for your uncomfortable questions. Looking back at my career, I've definitely hung out with a lot of talented snowboarders and crazy snowboarders and a lot of crazy stories, but I always kind of look back thinking I was just along for the ride, that I got lucky hanging out with the right people and the right times, the right moments in snowboards history. And I definitely feel very lucky. So that was time with Evo athlete Josh Dirksen. Josh has many other sponsors, but I like to call out the ones that we have in common. And Josh seems like such a chill dude for a guy that has been killing it for as long as he has. While you can tell that he is confident in what he does, there is no ego to Josh. And the way he answers questions, it's almost like it's calculated in making sure he doesn't throw anyone under the bus and he keeps it as positive as he can. Josh is a good dude who's had an amazing career and has an even better turn. That's the podcast for this week. At this point, I want to ask you to review me on iTunes. It takes less than a minute and here's what you need to do. First, click the podcast icon, then search for the Powell Movement, click my logo, scroll down to where you see the stars, click five stars, and you're done. It's easy and greatly appreciated. What's also appreciated at this time is having you support my sponsors if you can. Stanley makes some amazing pint glasses, Evo has all the deals, 686 has hands down the best outerwear in snow, and their everywhere pants and shirts are game-changing. And finally, 10 Barrel makes some tasty beers that will help you forget about this pandemic. And on that note, I hope everyone out there is healthy and making smart choices. Have a great week, everyone.